So not too long ago, I decided my dad wanted to take me and my friends skiing. And I was like, yeah, let's go skiing. This will be super fun. My dad is really good at skiing. And he's like, I'll show you the ropes. I had never done it before, but how hard can be? Um, and um, it's hard. So I showed up, and this wasn't like, we're going to go cool snowboarding or what. I was like, no, skis. And I went there and got all stuff. Who's skied in this room? Take notice, those are all the rich people in the room. Because honestly, skiing is so expensive. I'm like, thank God I'm with my dad, because I'm like, dad, flip the bill for this one, buddy. Um, and he did. Thanks, pops. Uh, got all geared up and whatever. And we go out to the slopes. And my dad's, you know, I'm like looking at all these hills that we're going to go down. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. What's that hill? He's like, that's the double black diamond. We won't be doing that today. And I was like, come again? <laughs> Don't tell me what I will not be doing today. <laughs> I will be doing that today. And he's like, that's adorable. And where we're going to go is over here to the bunny slopes. I'm like with six-year-olds, and he's teaching me how to like pizza and french fry and pizza and french fry and all half day. Honestly, if you're going to come at me with food, I'm in. But all day, pizza, french fry. And after a while, I'm like, all right, I got it. Pizza, french fry. How hard can this be? I'm going to go do the double black diamond. And he was like, you haven't died yet in life, and you should have. I'm pretty sure this mountain won't take you out, but I will see you in heaven. Goodbye, I'm not going with you. He's like, why don't you start with the green? Nope, I want to do the double black diamond. So I get on the gondola, sit down, starts to take you up, and it's going up and up. The air is thin. You know, I mean, we're getting high. There's clouds. I'm like, Jesus going up. And I'm so extroverted that I talk to myself all the time, out loud. If you go to a movie with me, I talk the whole time. I'm like, what are they doing? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I talk the whole time. So I'm talking on the gondola by myself. Wow, it's really, it's really cloudy up here. Oh, what's going on? I'm shaking like pizza, french fry, pizza, just talking. And I get to get off and as I'm getting off, which is a whole nother discussion, I'm getting off of the gondola and it like, you know, hit you, calm down, it hits you on the, the back. It's a whole thing to get off of that situation. But anyway, so I come around and I go to the top and all I'm just thinking is like, you got this. This cannot be that hard. I've already mastered the bunny slopes. I'm going to be fine. So I'm looking down and, and it's, it starts to go off a little slow. So I'm kind of like, you know, pizza, pizza going down. And it's, after a little while goes down, it just like drops off. And as I'm going down the mountain, I am like, pizza, pizza, pizza. You know, my thighs are like going crazy and jiggling. I'm like, pizza. And the little thingies, thingies clearly I'm a skier. Uh, the little thingies, you're, they're like flipped up because I'm like, I'm like dragging them on the side like, pizza. And, and then just like rocked into French fry. Like I was like, French fry, scooted it up. And I'm just going for it. And, and, I, and I'm coming out of the clouds. And as I'm just going down, yeah, it was cloudy because I was where Jesus lives. That he was skiing with me. It was me, Jesus, Holy Spirit. He was floating. But and I'm like going down. There's nobody else on there except for go, like one guy like past me. I'm like show off. Pizza! You know? So I'm going down and, and I'm coming out of the clouds and, and I see like two people off to the side and it's my dad and my friend Jen and, and I just like barrel past them and there's like just going down and there's these things called um, moguls. That's ski terms, because um, I'm, I'm a skier now. Um, and I, you can't really see them. They're just like little baby jumps for Olympic athletes. And I hit this mogul. And you know, you're supposed to look so cool in the air. I try to be cool, guys. I'm in the air. And you know, those, these guys are like, in the air. I'm like, ah, you know? My little thingies are, are flying everywhere. My legs are just like splits and I don't split. A and I just come down and just land so hard. And for girls in the room, you remember when you had like a Barbie and the legs just like could break off? You're like, that was weird. <laughs> um, that's what it felt like happened. Miraculously, I didn't break anything. I don't know how, but man, I hit the ground. Legs like snapped up like scorpioned, you know, and, and I just start rolling down and the snow is just piling into my face. And, and I, I somehow gravity, like I slow down and my dad comes, you know, all professional, like skis down on the side. I'm like, all right, show off. 
And he's like, hey, are you all right? I'm like, oh, it's just a really doozy. He's like, yeah, you just went past this screaming, no fear, no fear. And I'm like, I what? I'm, I'm talking out loud to myself on the slopes, screaming the whole time, no fear. And he's like, yeah. And you were yelling, French fry, French fry pizza. He was like, it was a lot of food dialogue and fear being screamed out. And I was like, well, I mastered the black diamond, clearly. Um, and I never need to do this again. Like, did it, been there, done it, it's achieved. You know, at the end of all of that, I cannot say that I am now a skier. Gravity just took me down a mountain, but I'm not technically a skier, nor was I transformed that day into being a skier. I was a girl falling down a mountain because gravity's real. That's all that happened that day. I do feel accomplished when people are like, yeah, have you ever gone skiing? I'm like, yeah, I've done like black diamonds and double black diamonds. And they're like, really? Do you want to go? No, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks. No, you don't want to see that happen. So often, I think in the Christian narrative, we have this um, kind of idea, and I kind of shared this in the lecture today, but there's this phrase going around and all these girls wear t-shirts about it, you know, like kill it for the kingdom or crushing it for the kingdom. And I'm like, all right, cool. It's a little aggressive, but cool. Um, and, and there is this kind of narrative that um, we just kind of grit our way through. We just kind of grit our way through faith. Like if we, if we grit our way through ministry, we grit our way through school and we kind of become proud of how much grit we're able to put into things that we really have a lot of kind of control over what we do. And if we could just muster up enough faith and enough grit that we can get onto the other side and man, we're really gonna make the, an impact. We're gonna really kill it for the kingdom. The Lord is really going to use us with all of our grit and all of our savvy. And, and, and I'm kind of looking at all that. And I'm like, man, I, I feel like we might have missed the mark. I feel like when we show up for things like this, or we show up to church, or we show up to class, or whatever, we, we kind of have this mindset that the expectation from God is he wants your grit. He wants your performance. He wants you to show up and, sh you know, just really show out and show up, you know, get it together. And, and I just, I, I feel like I think we're missing something here. In fact, we look at society and statistically we're burnt out. We're supposed to represent Christ in the most joyful, loving way, yet we're tired, we're burnt out, we're grouchy. We are honest about what's really going on inside of us. We are really good at masking it. And that's just not Christians, that's humans in general. But this idea and this narrative of grit has kind of become a stamp of, look how great I am. Look how much I can do. Look how much I am doing for the kingdom of God. And so I wanna share with you guys a little bit something that I kind of have been diving in my own personal self um, and it comes from um, the book of Acts in verse 16. Uh, we kind of find uh, Paul here, and uh, Paul's been traveling around. Y'all know about Paul, massive conversion, total misfit. God changes his heart, still a misfit but God uses them. Um, that's the great thing about the Bible is he just uses misfits all the time, like messed up, crazy people. And he's like, yep, you'll do. Um, so he's, so all of you in here should feel really good about yourself because if, if Peter can be used, so can you. If Paul can be used, so can you. If I can be used, surely so can you. Uh, so here we find Paul. Paul is wanting to actually go into Asia. He's so transformed. He wants to share the truth of God's word. And so he wants to go into Asia. God, the Holy Spirit tells him no. He's like, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of people in Asia. We can make a big impact. God says no. Gives him a vision about a man. I want you to go to Macedonia. And I want you to meet this guy there in the city of Philippi. So he shows up in Philippi. There's like literally no Judaism, no Jewish religion, or even synagogue. All you need is 10 guys to make a synagogue, and they don't even have that. There's nothing there. So it comes around to Sabbath, and he knows, Paul knows that oftentimes, if there is any Jewish people, they'll be down by this water area on Sabbath for prayer. And sure enough, he finds himself down by the water. And that's where we kind of pick up in chapter 16 um, of Acts. And it says here, so uh, on verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we were expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening to what I was saying. 
the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying, and she and her household were baptized. She urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. So here we have uh, Paul meet Lydia. It's kind of cool because the vision that he got was actually of a man that he was gonna meet a man, and I always wonder about that, like God was like, eh, it's gonna be a woman, but that's gonna trip you out, so I'm just gonna tell you it's a man. He shows up and meets Lydia. Now let me tell you a little bit about Lydia. Lydia's important to know. This is the only time that she's referenced by name here. Uh, Lydia comes from Thyatira. Thyatira, I love maps. You should love maps because maps are cool and maps make the world come alive. And if you don't like maps, then you're like 99% of the people in the world and I'm a nap, map geek. But Thyatira is about 350 miles uh, from Philippi. Here Lydia grew up in the city of Thyatira. Thyatira is where shells would be broken down and they'd produce this purple kind of goo and it would, um, um, they'd be able to use it to dye cloth. And this cloth would, would be what rich people would buy and own. Purple was a place of majesty and, and statute. And so she's kind of like your modern day Chanel blogger, um, really like uh, on the cutting edge of fashion. And she decides to, you know, she tells her parents, uh, I'm gonna move to Philippi and take my business um, to Philippi. And she has to travel 350 miles, you know, she didn't have a car. This is by feet, maybe a donkey, I don't know. But she fashioned some kind of ride or some kind of walking and got all the way to Philippi to be able to establish this business. Now, we do know a little bit about Lydia um, in the, and Thyatira. Thyatira had a huge Jewish, uh, Jewish community. And so we know that she was a Gentile. We know that she was a pagan worshiper, at least her family was pagan worshipers. Well, I don't know exactly what they believed, but we know that they were not monotheistic. So they, she was, something drew her to Judaism. Something drew her to this single God. And we know that because when Paul found her, she is hanging out with Jewish people. She is not Jewish. And it says that she is God-fearing. So we know that there is something that God has been stirring in her heart all the way in Thyatira. She's moved all the way to Philippines. Philippi, we also know that she has established a, build, a, a business. In all tents and purposes, she is killing it for the world. She is at the top of her game. All the ladies are like, dang, you know, Lydia's doing it without a man. And, and that's a big deal because back then, like, you don't do that. You always had a covering. And even we know that she says that something probably happened. She's probably widowed, but never got remarried. But she's actually the head of her household. That was like unheard of back then, like crazy unheard of. And we know that because she had her household baptized. And when she asked Paul to come and stay, she didn't ask permission. She had the authority. So this, this woman is like killing it. She has all the grit you can think of. It was super anti-Semitic at that time. So the fact that she was even hanging out with Jews and she, she would like didn't care. This girl is gritty. She got it going on. She's got a business. She got a household. She's hanging out with Jews. Don't even care. Like she doesn't care. She's selling to the rich and famous. Something in her is drawing her to Jesus. I find it interesting as, as Paul finds her. Here she is by the water and he says that she is God fearing. And yet as Paul is telling her the story about Jesus, it says that the Holy Spirit opens her heart. I find that so many of us come to church. We come to school, we come to chapel, whatever you come to, and many of us, if not all of us, would say, we're God-fearing. We believe in God. But the problem is, is that many of us have not been transformed by the grace of God that we have not allowed God's grace to enter into our life. In fact, what we start to pride ourselves on is our grit, is what we give before the world and what we offer before the world and before God. Lydia's grit had never encountered God's grace. It was really at the, she was limited in what she could do. In fact, when you rely solely on grit and just being God-fearing, you will never have the impact that you wanna have. It is only until your grit marries and couples and meets God's grace that you will be able to start to have the impact that you were actually purposed to have. I wanna show you something. When, when we look at grit and we look at kind of the, you know, we kind of um, 
uh, admonish grit. You know, we kind of, we all hold it high. We look at it as something as like, man, she's, she's really successful or he's really sick or he's climbing the corporate ladder. He's really gritting his way through or he's really killing it for the kingdom. And, and we kind of look at that, but in our own life, what does grit really say about us? Often grit is really self-sufficiency and self-sufficiency at its root is pride. Pride that says, I can do this on my own. If I could just work harder, if I could just perform more, if I could just show up, I just have to do one more thing. Let me check one more box. I'm just gonna help out, serve, contribute. And the problem is, is that you are not operating in the fullness of the authority and what God has given you. You have now taken it on human standards to say, I got this. It is within my own self-sufficiency that I will complete this. And self-sufficiency then turns at the root of it to pride. So what does God say about pride? God says in 1 Peter chapter 5, Verse six, it says here, or verse five, it says, but God resists the proud, we've heard it, but gives grace to the humble. Do you know that the, the, that the Greek word there, resist, actually means to push away, that he actually has to push you away when your pride keeps you from him. And we go, well, how's he done? He's a loving God, he's supposed to love me. Why would he push me away when I'm prideful? He's like, I can't get into that. I can't work when you're in the way. Your pride, your grit, your powering through is keeping me from allowing my power to manifest itself in your life. He says, but every word should be important to you in the scriptures. Every word you read has power on it and life on it. Study it. Don't let me tell you what the scripture says. Take what I am telling you, go home and study it because this is the only thing that's going to give you life, true life. I don't care what I say. I don't care what lecture you hear. I don't care what book you read. I don't care how smart you are, or how dumb you are. If you don't know the word of God, you will be dragged every which way. But when you study the word and you fall in love with it because it's interesting and it's fascinating and it will change your life, not because of condemnation or doctrine or theology, but because of the love of the words that are written on this pages, it will change the course of your life because God says, I will resist the proud, but, and that's a big but, <laughs> God gives grace to the humble. You see, we mistake mercy and grace. I love when people say, you know, it's by the grace of God that I'm alive. I'm like, no, it's by the mercy of God that you're alive. You don't deserve to breathe. I mean, that's just about that none of us do. You know, we don't deserve to even be here. Mercy is undeserved. It's, it, it's, it's, God, it's God's like, all y'all should go down in flames because y'all a hot mess. But my mercy keeps you alive. My mercy is where I, you're here. Grace of God is what we receive as an undeserved gift. And this grace, hear me out, gives you access to the power of God. This is what happens when grit meets grace. You see, Lydia was limited in her impact. By the world's standards, she was killing it. But by God's standards, he was like, oh, I have so much more for you. Because he says that I give grace to the humble. And then he goes on to say in verse six, and he tells you how to do it. I love when people are like, I never know what God wants from me. I'm like, it, it says it right, it says it right here. So, okay, let's read it. Um, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. And I love, we love to be exalted. I want to follow Jesus and be exalted. I just want to grip my way and be exalted. We, we want that. All of us want that. No matter what, you did not come to school to be like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I mean, I'm just going to work at Starbucks. Nothing wrong with that. But y'all didn't come to school for that. You have a vision. You have a dream. You have an idea. And hear me clearly, friends. If you don't learn this concept, you will burn out so quick that whatever vision you had, whatever purpose you thought you had, if you do it within your own power, you will be limited, you will burn out, and you will become jaded because your pride will keep you from the intimacy and power that God wants to give you. So when God says you need to be humble, this is a surrender of your heart and your life, and we'll get to that, but God is not only saying be humble, but he's saying I want you to humble yourself under my hand which is really surrendering so that 
you can be exalted at the proper time. Exaltation looks like a rising above, not circumstances never happening, but a rising above of circumstances that will inevitably happen. It gives you access to this. And so God is saying, look, I wanna offer all the power that I have. My grace gives you access to this, but you gotta humble your heart. And I have so many people come up to me and they go, okay, great. I had this one girl sitting with me. She goes, you know, I've really tried this humble thing. She literally said, I'm the most humble person you'll ever meet. I was like, hmm, I feel like that's not true if you said that. <laughs> and, and, she, she, and people come, how do I become humble? What, what does it actually mean tangibly to become humble? And I said this, get honest. It's time to get honest. What does that mean? Okay. Get honest about the deep, fragile places of your heart because your grit is really covering up for your pain. Your grit is trying to work so hard to feel worthy, to feel seen, to feel powerful, and it happens all across the board. You are no different than a 50-year-old that sits in my office. You are no different than my eight-year-old who struggles with wanting to be seen and known and loved. It's the flesh desire within us, but it's also the spirit man in us that wants to see, be seen by our creator. And so your grit is driving you out of often your pain. So God is saying, look, I don't need you to perform for me. What I want is access to your heart. Humility comes in a place of honesty and surrender. God, I need you to be Lord over my life. You see, I look around this room and I know there's a lot of God-fearing people in this room. But I know, statistically, in doing this for 24 years, that transformation for many of you has not happened. That you have known about God, that you believe in God. You're God-fearing, but you have not surrendered and humbled your heart before God under his mighty hand where he can allow his grace to pour in. And that's where transformation happens. Lydia reached the pinnacle of what she could do. But the moment that she met Paul and Jesus spoke, his grace poured into her life and she began to be transformed. And then her household was transformed. And then Paul stayed with her and taught her. And she was the very first convert in Europe, all of Europe, Lydia, some girl, Lydia was known all over and literally started the church in Philippi, which was the beginning of what was happening in Europe, all through the heart and mind of Lydia, through the transformation of her heart and life. You see, God says, he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. Lydia's begun in Thyatira. She started to learn about God, and I believe many of you are here, just because I know your age. You're learning about God. You're wrestling out some of your stuff. It's so good, don't stop wrestling out your faith. Ask hard questions. Be angry when you need to be angry and talk to him about it. Let him in, wrestle it out because he who began a good work in Thyatira will complete it in Philippi. So where he's beginning in your life, where you started to find Jesus when you were four or 10 or maybe this last year and he began a good work, he's faithful to complete it. That is his promise to you. But it happens not through your grit, not through your fighting through. It doesn't happen through your doctrinal beliefs. It will not happen that way. It will happen through the supernatural power of God's grace entering into the fragile places and broken places of your heart. So you're gonna grit your way through and you are going to find yourself spinning and striving and wondering why it's not working out. Wondering why you get two steps forward and two steps back. You know, wonder what you look around, you're gonna begin to get jaded because your pride is gonna to say to you, God doesn't care about you. He's blessing everyone else. They must have favor. By the way, all of you have favor because you're the favorite of God. Everyone's anointed. No one's more anointed. They just have different gifts. Carrie, you're so anointed. So are you. Same anointing. Same Jesus, same Holy Spirit. I just have a loud mouth. That's it. <laughs> Not more anointed. But transformation has happened in my life because all I knew my whole life was grit and hustle, to be honest with you. I'm the hustler since I was a kid. Raised a hustler, slanging drugs, doing all this crazy stuff. Then God gets a hold of my heart and he allows me to be free from the bondage of grit. 
because it's the moment that his grace comes in and starts to transform the very fragile places of my heart. I'm still driven as all get out. Don't get me wrong. I'm three on the Enneagram. I am like, achiever, let's go. The light is green, you go. My husband's like, the light's green, let's talk about going. I'm like, ah! The light turns yellow, he's like, let's slow down. I'm like, no, no, you speed, man. Get through it, save 2.3 seconds. I still got grit. He didn't change those desires. What he's done is I've surrendered those desires and those, the, the, the fragile, the wounded places of my grit under the mighty hand of God. And now his grace is starting to transform me. I'm still in process. Nobody's arrived ever. If they have ever said they've arrived, run. They're heretics. No one's ever arrived, ever. No one. Not one person in this room, not one of your teachers, not one of your pastors, your parents, nobody. Nobody's arrived. We don't arrive till we see the face of Jesus. We're all in process and in the process of transformation, but transformation will never happen through your grit. Will never happen through you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or having mo more faith. You will never have enough faith. You will never have enough faith to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in you. You will never have enough faith to heal the brokenness of your heart. You will never have enough faith to rise up and change the world. You will never have enough. But what you will have is God's mighty hand in your life. And what does he say he will do when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? He will what? Exalt you. He will rise you up. It does not come through you powering through or killing it for the kingdom. It comes through you surrendering to the kingdom. So for me, when I look at this and I want to ask, you know, for you guys, God, what is it that you want from me? Often we look at God through the grid of what we've been taught or told in our families or whatever. And we think that somehow in our head we get it, but in our heart we actually believe that, no, I do need to perform. I do need to grit my way through. I will be a disappointment to God and my family if I don't show up better, if I don't power through. And can I break a lie off of you tonight that this is a lie from the enemy? And it will only, it looks spiritual, it sounds spiritual, it is pride. And pride will keep Jesus from being able to get in and heal and pour his grace into your life. So what do we do? How do we start, Carrie? How do we begin? You start to ask yourself some really hard questions. What's my motive here? Why am I doing this? In what areas of my life does God want to come in? I promise you, if you spend 10 minutes and you say, God, show me. Show me what's keeping me from really hearing you and really being transformed. Show me the fragile place that I'm holding on to. I promise you, if you are quiet for 10 minutes, boy, you'll get a memory. You'll get a thought. And it won't be out of condemnation. He'll say, I'm so glad you asked because all I wanna do is empower you. All I wanna do is send my grace upon you to give you access to power of so much more for you than you could ever do on your own. You know what I love about the story of Lydia? I love that today you are affected by Lydia's life, that you are hearing her story today because it was so profound in the transformation that God said, I want her in the book. That's what he wants to do with your life. Lydia's story would have died and never been remembered had she had not allowed the grace of God to transform her and effectively heal the world around her. She was part of the gospel message. That is your call here, friends. Don't let the world tell you anything else. I'm out there in all the countries speaking to all the crazy people that look just like me and you. And they're all hurting and they all need space and they all need someone to rise up and say, God wants to meet you right where you are. You have an opportunity to meet them in that place. But no matter how much you grit your way through or what vision plan you have or what Enneagram number you are, especially you eights in the room, they will not be totally affected or impacted by your life without Christ in it. There will be no legacy. It will die with you. And that's not why we're here. So I want to encourage you tonight 
to ask yourself the question, what does God need to be Lord over my life? Maybe you are in a place where you are just God-fearing. And you realizing in this moment, you know what? She's right. I mean, show, I show up. I do what I'm supposed to do. I check a box. I go to church on Sunday. I even wear my good tennis shoes, you know? I show up to chapel probably because I have to, but I do show up. I do all the classes. I read the Bible. In fact, I even know some memorized scripture. John 3, 16, I got you. But the reality is, is that this is not what God wants This is not what God desires. God is so less interested in what you do for him. He is so much more interested in what you can be with him. This is what he wants for you. And I think we're missing out. And I want to just end with this. Women, I will always talk to you because I do a ton of women's stuff, but men, I just want to address you really quick because you live in a society that is telling you that you don't have a voice that you are not allowed to love well, that you are not allowed to show affection, that you are not allowed to speak truth, that you are supposed to put your head down and provide and climb a ladder, but that you do not have a powerful voice. And I want to speak to you right now that God has anointed you to rise up and become leaders in our nation and in our homes to restore family and to restore peace. So many of us women are wounded by the voice of men in our lives and you have the ability from God to speak life over the women in your lives. This is your calling. This is your calling to heal what the enemy is trying to break. And somewhere along the way we have been told and you have been told that it is weakness that it is small and it is insignificant and that your voice is not big. But let me tell you, at 44 years old, I know that's shocking for all of you because you thought I was 25, I'm not. But at 44 years old, when my dad calls me, just talked to him this morning, and he said to me, I am so proud of you. It's like instantly something heals in my heart. When my husband looks at me and he says, I am so proud of you, something heals in my heart. This is the power that you have. So whatever wounds you are carrying, your family, your wives, your children are depending on you to allow God into those fragile places so that his grace can empower you to help heal the world. And he will give you all the resources you need. He will provide all that you need. But all he's saying is, humility says, here's where I'm broken. I don't wanna be God-fearing. I wanna be transformed by the grace of God. I wanna know you in transformative ways. And ladies, it is not okay to mask and stuff and cover and grit your way through. We are masters at it. And it'll be the very thing that takes you out. So I believe God is wanting to call you to something. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.